truth of beauty. Beauty of truth. Meaning. Embellishing it. Enhancing the truth. But just the simple truth is beauty. These are very um, demanding questions for one's own self. Let less when you teach music from other composers to students who are eager to know what am I supposed to bring out in this place? And the answer might be, what do you hear? Do we hear what the composer heard when they composed it, regardless how they wanted it to be played, because perhaps it's only one of many ways, even if it's their own, regardless if we have it recorded or just notated, because it is a personal connection for each student with the piece. I don't wake up in the morning coming to teach thinking I'll just impose mine, because, after all, asymmetrically, I am in my position to do so. Because I find that um, the young people of this generation that I meet and teach here and who trust me to advise them and guide them, coming from so far away, is because ultimately I think we are all searching for the same thing as the students ourselves, as teachers later, and I take very much the with humility, the very um, sense, I think, of um, maturity of this young generation it doesn't satisfy itself with binary questions being answered binary, soft or fast, loud or soft, or any silly obvious things, major, minor, minor, major. Oh, I know, it's all my lingo. But in fact, the subtleties of music are embedded and the simplicity of the expression is what really touches the hearts. So it's not about sophistication for the sake of it, even if the texture is, and you have to deal with how to layer what to bring out or not, and how much, and what is the touch, articulation, phrasing. Um, dynamics, um, subtlety of touch within the key or above the key, how do you deal with the melodic repeated notes, in other words there are ways to shape what the truth of the score is but the score doesn't sing or play unless you bring it up to play it and of course um, when it's a famous piece you're locked in in tradition, edition publishers and performers and famous articles and people who want to know, no. So you cannot convince them. They come already pre-convinced. I don't as a teacher. I come open-minded to hear what they have to see and what they saw there for in the piece. But you know, the audiences either come for the storytelling, either they come to criticize. Let less the juries, the auditions, the professionals who have to screen or um, judge, eliminate or accept or put in some kind of criteria, more or less subjective, inevitably, alas, of an order of preference. And so you think there must be a truth to it, not just an interpretation as a point of view, as some composers like Ravel said, on ne m'interprète pas, on ne joue. One doesn't interpret me, one plays me. Stravinsky said interpretation is betrayal. Fine, possibly, in their point of view. But there's something more universal than interpretation, is appropriation. And I think that for a student to feel empowered, to come in not just for the sake of it, or by some kind of originality that would be more on the level of eccentricity, to say for the sake of it I'll do something different just to be different regardless if it has the meaning to it. But there are layers of nuances within the same meaning. You can play a funeral march moderately or slower. That's still funeral march. If you play it presto, it's relatively not believable. And so if you don't believe it, why do you do it? Just to please, and who, and what, and through which edition, and we have some kind of um, 
intangible truths, therefore, that come through the score in the playing. And then, of course, you hear recordings of others and you start thinking, well, why don't they do this? How come they don't do that? Then why am I doing it? And then, of course, the technical aspects of the, how do I fetch it? How do I bring this bass compared to the harmony? How do I anticipate in the fetching by being able to touch it before I play it? Therefore, I have to shift faster than the tempo allows me between the beats, or then even take extra time. What is better? Miss and be a nanosecond later with a quality of sound on the real note, or be exactly on tempo and possibly miss the note or not be able to control it by landing on it. That happens all the time with basses to fetch and chords to fit in accompaniments in any music of the classic and romantic era that has this kind of melody with accompaniment style. Therefore, the rubato comes as a good situation to organize this um, um, sort of div division of the left hand into two hands, one for the bass note, one for the harmonization, and all that under the right hand, which has normally the lead melodically, at least thematically. And I share these thoughts with you because I find that it's very important that uh, we respect the student's intuition and not always shape them into our knowledge and experience. Because perhaps our visible part of the iceberg is not fitting on their underwater iceberg place. I try to hear what is their motivation, their inclination, their fear, their desire, the legato, the singing legato, the over legato, the quality of the legato, the tempo, not losing a slow tempo into subdivision or keeping the slow tempo in stretched slow beats but still have a group of bars or beats that connect and become this kind of flow of narrative storytelling. And of course this is easy said, difficultly done because Pianos respond differently, acoustics respond differently, and then you feel more vulnerable to all these variables of adjustment for which um, you have to um, be able to, as a pianist, always adapt, more or less. Mm. The technique allows to be for in touch technique, in touch control technique allows to let's say, minimize the surprises, but in the unexpected always happens. And to be honest, when you're young, you don't care so much about the truth of what you play. You want to play the meaning of what it is to you and what you want to bring to the others from what it means to you. Oh, so beautiful, oh, so meaningful. I want to bring this, I want to bring that. Oh, but I miss it and oh, I almost know it. And I've heard many often times students say, I almost know it from memory because the secret is in the, often the detail and the detail is often in the transitions in the bridges. That's where the artistry is felt because it's somehow coated in fusion with uh, craftsmanship as well as in the very form of the piece where the composer subtly brings in things, ways that you just enter in the next theme or you return into recapitulation. And um, you have to merge in traffic um, subtly because you can never keep the metronomic tempo for which you have to practice by counting loud voice and using it as a metronome to double check. But when you play in performance, you have to count, but then you have to also know which are the sections where there will be adjustments, but they have to be done in the place where it's least obvious. So that when you have a ritornello, let's say in a rondo form, it doesn't feel like, oh, oops, I'm too slow now or too fast. So that's experience. But ultimately, I think that um, music making is responding to what beauty is. And if we have to define beauty versus truth, truth is beauty in the piece we trust to play. We don't have to enhance it to make it beautiful. Or craftsmanship would say that. Artists would say it's mine to be told. My way. 
And sometimes you hear a piece that you play as a student and you hear others play it and you go, why don't they hear what I hear in it or see what I see in it or bring out what I want to bring out in it? Or they play too fast or they play too slow. All this is a bit superficial. As, um, but in fact, it describes the fact that so much of the meaning of the music of a specific piece means differently to many different people less in time with styles and uh, expectations of rubato or delayed notes or broken basses with melodic lines people say that's old-fashioned today we don't do substitutions because pianos are better and better equalized so we do five 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 instead of finger legato finger pedal we do everything with pedal most people, not all. And what is the added benefit? Is it confidence because it's going to come out well on any instrument? Is it um, the pleasure to handle it ergonomically in a way that you don't feel you control it, it controls you, but nevertheless you have the impression that you're more reliable than vulnerable to the unexpected, which inevitably happens. And so you try to teach technique, which I try to teach, so that the students who play the pieces that they play have the most reliable fingering um, capacity, shifting, anticipation, gestural memorization of elements, which you cannot do in real time when there are so many things going on. just to give them the chance to have a peace of mind relatively so when they have stress and nervousness on stage to have enough brain power to control what and where they go with the piece formally, dynamically, uh, drivenly and a certain expectation of not planning it all other than organizing it and then let it just happen the way it happens the moment we play and accept it that is not going to be the reproduction of the practicing pattern because the hearing is way more alert when you perform because people listen to you and that already psychologically makes you feel that you're more attuned to what you do and how they think you do it. And when you practice repetitively, you don't listen as intensely. So you just finger watch your playing and you say, oh, well, I have an autopilot. But you have to be always mentally ahead of what you play in terms of gesture, dynamics, phrasing. And if the unexpected happens, then deal with it. You delay to play a note, then you'll delay the next note to make it appear like it was planned. All this has to happen in a split second on the spot. So you have to have a knowledge of a group of bars by looping, practicing, so that you can have like Lego constructions, uh, bricks of, um, technically speaking, not the music, which of course often goes way beyond in bridging phrases that are like horizon bond. But the detail matters. And therefore, when you do cells and cells of details put together, it doesn't make it a whole, but at least you navigate through it without to fear a hopefully memory slip or um, a tempo loss or anything that goes on. Since we don't have a conductor to play with like the orchestras do, you are your own conductor and your own orchestra and your own tempo choice. Um, your own teacher during the performance and what you want to bring out in the voicing becomes like your own stage manager bringing out um, which elements of the text to be more meaningfully brought out or not or blending or fusion fusion of elements that you colorize with lights and shadows on the piano and the forte, obviously, or the mezzo piano, or the mezzo forte, or the mezzo pianissimo, mezzo fortissimo. That's rare. It's a dynamic indication, though I like it very much because I think it leaves always for that little room extra, up or under, so that you don't navigate between soft and loud, with or without unicorda. And sometimes it's needed for drastic subito changes, but then for the rest, you can do it with a finger touch from close up.
straight fingers deep in the keys of the edges so that the action responds without lagging, especially if it's soft dynamics in the lower register where the pianos have a heavier action. You have to take all that in account, incorporate it in the muscular memory, and then deliver that truth that is beautiful. Your own truth. Not necessarily your teachers or your publishers or your uh, mentors or your admired pianists imitating or not. It's necessary to have some kind of a role model. But I think that the generation of today are more critical because they have so much more and beautifully so easy access to variety of performances. And they don't have to be um, so strict about trusting the teacher. After all, it's one opinion among others. But the teacher takes the intention towards um, the explanation to a certain extent of this tempo will bring you to do this. In a Siciliana, you incorporate the 16th note, that is the shorter one after the delayed detto date. In a, I don't know, in a jig, it's more jumpy. In a, so there is some kind of rational explanation of how and why you choose the tempo and in which tempo you're comfortable and you try the metronome to find fine-tune when you're just within the limits of the tempo in which your touch control allows you to play it. It's not just play it with the notes, typing them, it's shape them, mean them, bring them. And they all contribute toward that truth, that beauty. A sense of admiration for the beauty. Beauty is something in the eye of the beholder and not always shared the same way, but perhaps there are some common threads to it. You can be convinced or convincing in both, or you can be just doing what you're told. You might not be that convincing, but you try to find out how you fit in all that between what you're told to do or not to do, mostly not to do, and what you want to do with it, and how you want to bring it, and deadlines are coming too early, and you don't have time because you have other classes, and, well, life, that's what happens in life. I'm sure the composers also, when they composed those pieces, had life interrupting their composition of them, and centuries later reaching you, and you feel like infusion, and, in unity with a composer, centuries apart. And I find that to be a miracle of beauty, in fact. A melodic line, it's an unbelievably unforgettable perfume. A harmonic coating is like a hug, a pedal uh, marking that allows you to hold the bass while you change a harmony, brings you to hear um, sort of hinted dissonances within um, flows of elements. Not everything is hospital floor clean to be with the pedaling, though after the beat is better to avoid the residue of the preceding harmony. But sometimes there is this little lingering, this little... So there are ways to um, bring um, something really to the subtle detail while not losing in mind the fact that it's the whole thing that justifies the peace, not the details, but without them there is no peace. So a technique is not just to play through cleanly, is to play through cleanly and musically, not or musically. And if musically independently means phrasing, legato, hairpin, dynamics, rubato, the type of expression then the technique, the touch control, the agility of the thumb, the capacity of the straight thumb, the agility independence of five and four with single tendon to be independent, to give you the capacity to shape every detail with independence of fingers, with connection of thoughts, even between middle voices played between the two hands compared to individual voices played in the outer parts of the two hands. So in other words, the two hands is a one single double hand and at the same time, the brain organizing and the heart leading with a soulful feeling about the peace. 
I find it fascinatingly responsible to help students navigate through these elements that they have to coordinate. It's not musical or beautifully clean, it's musical and beautifully clean. The truth is in the notes and the values and the indications and the dynamics and the phrasings and the articulations when they're indicated, but it's also in between the notes, between the uh, shiftings, between uh, suspicions. If you do a suspension by the composer and you do it with a substitution to connect the legato, that would be if not just either pedal connected, either just uh, finger disconnected. But if you do the substitution, it might. And then, of course, that is a problem because then the balance of the hand is more vulnerable when you do a substitution. So you have to practice that. And... Um, Every mean reaches a purpose, and I think that is how you explain it when you teach rather than when you perform, and people either admire or dislike, but um, you offer them the finished product. Here you, you work with the student on the building of it, from the learning to the understanding to the um, avoiding or trying to avoid, make them avoid the mistakes that will take them longer to fix because inevitably they come in with the learning. And not just notes misreading, but um, shiftings and phrasings, and sometimes the notes anyway are misguessed rather than misread, which is a good thing. That means the intuition works. But it wasn't the one of the composer's intuition. Like, we don't have the hearing of the composer, but we tend to try to get close to it so we can guess when you wonder, what is there no dynamic marking in this section? Am I supposed to reproduce? Then it's guessable and analytically practical to, uh, to, to, defy, to define it. Or then you say, perhaps the composer wanted to be finally, as in improvisation often is, intuitive and uh, spontaneous and not always reproducing the patterns, so it's not to be guessable. Logic is good, but not all. Intuitive is good, but not always. And spontaneous is marvelous, but not continuously. But a little of all of this together, and in which blending proportions, that is the very subtle guidance for the teacher to sense and teach while hearing the intuitions, the intentions that the student tries to bring in the piece. And if you feel like his student is going in the wrong direction, in your opinion, then you have to say it about saying, this is my opinion. I hear it like this because I understand it like that. And you give an example. And sometimes I give an example of how the composer could have done it differently by going a different way to the next set of elements. Would it be thematic or something? A different type of modulation, different type or no modulation, or different type of um, uh, bridging to go to the next section and merge in the next traffic. And all that brings you a different dynamics and energy and the modulation, the colors of the tonality and eventually secondary voices and um, accidentals that come and uh, that alter the tonality from major to minor, but halfway only and not. Once you take into account all these things, you just has to, you have to play the flow of things. And of course, then the objective fact is the truth. And the truth is beautiful. And sometimes when you write uh, a composer's uh, music yourself by copying it in order to play it, you feel how much it goes into every detail, the choice of a disposition, the choice of a note. And when you play it through, and nobody hears everybody, doesn't hear everything, some things you take for granted, say, oh, of course, you know. But in fact, when you play it, like Schubert, Mozart, Mendelssohn, are very exposed and very clear textures, the slightest thing is immediately destroying, like a domino effect, everything falls down. You know, I have notes to hide behind chromaticism, pedals, and over chords. Just different style and different uh, difficulties in its own way. But for the clarity of this, if everything is in place, people say it's okay, it's normal. And you go, do you know what it takes to control all this, to maintain all this in terms of concentration and application and anticipation? These are the concepts I constantly tell the students, think ahead. And then, there be yourself. Not grotesquely or trying to be um, eccentrically original for the sake of it, as I said earlier. Just because 
you are who you are. You're not the copy of the teacher nor the copy of the publisher. Um, you're not the spokesman or some kind of recitant of the text. Through the text, through the appropriation of the text, you tell your truth, and that's beautiful.